Ah, not again. I've been high all day. I'm giving Jeremy a buzz. <laughs> Steve, what's up, bro? Hey, Jeremy. I just wanted to run by you. I've been high all day long. No way, dude. I've been high all day too. Really? Well, at least I'm not the only one. That makes me feel a little bit better. Are you kidding me, dude? This is amazing. I didn't know you got high. When did this start? Jeremy, you know I've been doing this for 50 years. What? Jeremy, you know I've been doing this for 50 years. No, no, dude. No, you're not. What are we even talking about right now, dude? Jeremy, I, I called you to tell you my blood sugar's been high all day. I ate a couple donuts for breakfast. I had one after lunch. No way, dude. I've been eating donuts all day, too. This is getting creepy. Well, Jeremy, maybe that's why you're high. No, dude. The donuts didn't make me get high. <laughs> the high made me get the donuts. <laughs> but anyways, my blood sugars have been amazing today, dude. My time and range has been like 99%. <laughs> Jeremy, you just told me you've been high all day. Totally. Totally high. Jeremy, I don't know what the hell you're talking about. Me neither, dude. <laughs> me neither. All right. Well, I hope you enjoyed our little intro. We had a lot of fun making that. The script kind of writes itself. Um, but, you know, we wanted to talk about marijuana and diabetes. And I love, you know... I had a lot of fun Googling um, pictures and stuff for this talk. So this one came up, diabetics are the only people who take drugs to avoid getting high, uh, which just says it all. Um, and, you know, I have to admit that in, in making this talk, um, there's a lot more to this than I initially thought in terms of the research with marijuana in general and health, and then specifically to diabetes. So this is the talk that I probably spent the most time on just kind of researching and learning about. And we have to ask this question, why, why do we want to talk about this, this topic? And you know, I'd say there's actually a third reason. So one, marijuana use is very common. And I'm going to give numbers about you know, how common this is. So you know, I think there's still this kind of like giggly culture about it or like, you know, like it was a lot of judgment associated around it. Um, but that's kind of the second point that it's also now legal in most states. So this is a legal drug that is used by a lot of people. So we have to have this thing. So we can't have our head in the sand about it. You know, this idea of like, you know, it's just these people over here or those people using it. And we shouldn't talk about it. You just shouldn't do it. Um, again, if you have a common medication that's used by a lot of people, you need to talk about it. And then the third reason that's actually not on here is, yeah, you know, what is the research? This is a legitimate research topic where people are looking into the medicinal effects of marijuana and specifically when it comes to diabetes. So people have a lot of questions about it. So just, you know, burying our head in the sand is... is um, not the way to go about it. And it's perfect for this conference because it's a very taboo topic. You know, it's something that people certainly do not feel comfortable uh, bringing up to their health care providers or doctors. They don't want to be judged, you know, um, et cetera. So it's, it's generally just not talked about. And on the physician side, they probably don't know what they can or can't say. So it's just like this perfect example of a taboo topic. I mean, alcohol is already kind of difficult enough and it's, you know, legal and it's very commonly used and doesn't have some of the kind of like taboo-ness associated with it. But even that people aren't kind of you know, comfortable talking about. So that's why we want to jump in with this. Now, this says, what is more common, using marijuana or having diabetes in the United States? If you had to guess, is there more people in the United States living with diabetes, type 1 and type 2 all together, we're all blood brothers, or people that use marijuana? And it's, it's very similar. There's, but actually, there's more people that use marijuana. There's 40 million Americans. They say about 12%. That's been pretty constant of people that are at least willing to admit on a survey that they use marijuana. And 12% is about you know, 40 million Americans versus 34 or so million uh, people living with diabetes. So that means that there's more people using marijuana than there is with anybody using any diabetes drug. It's more common than any diabetes drug. So of course we need to talk about you know, the effects that it's gonna have. It's not to say that everybody with diabetes is using marijuana. It's just saying that it's, it's again, it's very, very common. And when we talk about where this is legal, I was really trying to find a map that would kind of change over time in terms of states that have legalized it, but it has rapidly increased, meaning you know more and more states are making this legal. And there's two things that kind of stick out. So first, 
the kind of black ones are places that it, it's fully legalized. So, you know, we're in here in San Diego, we got our legal marijuana in kind of all the West Coast uh, states and then some in the East Coast. And then the other greens are places that have, you know, they're just like, they're used for medicinal use or they're at least decriminalized. And it's only the white ones that it's still, you know, fully illegal. So you kind of have the whole spectrum across the United States, fully legal, fully, fully legal, fully illegal. So obviously you have to abide by, you know, whatever state you're living in and, you know, follow the rules there. Uh, I hope it goes without saying that we would re never recommend at TCYD doing anything illegal, that you have to be in a state where this is legally used and you're using it safely, which is another, you know, reason of doing this talk. But this has, you know, very rapidly changed over time, that it wasn't long ago that this was a completely illegal drug. And now, you know, the, the trends are for this to be completely legalized in, in the United States. So when you think back, three, four, five years ago, you know, what bearing, buying marijuana was like, I mean, it was a good drug deal. This was a, uh, an illegal substance and, you know, people had to do this, you know, black market, like however people would get uh, marijuana. And now this is a, a marijuana dispensary. I had a lot of fun Googling, you know, most beautiful marijuana dispensaries. And there's some really good looking ones, but this is moved, you know, far beyond just kind of these backstreet corner, you know, drug deals to now like a multi-billion dollar business with these, you know, beautiful dispensaries and all different types of products and things like that. So it's evolving really quickly. And I think even quicker than the perception about it. Um, clearly, I think most of people in the country are still on this idea of this is a legal drug, illegal drug. We shouldn't be talking about, you know, we shouldn't be legitimizing. Um, but people are still kind of in that mindset. Versus, you know, from a you know, kind of economic standpoint, it's just blown up. And this really just said it all to me. When we first went into our lockdown here in California and only essential businesses could, could stay open. This is from Forbes. It says California marijuana, marijuana stores still essential can remain open during latest COVID-19 shutdown. So, and that's true. Our marijuana dispensaries have been open this whole time because they were deemed an essential business for, you know, medical reasons or whatever. So in a number of years, a couple of years, it's gone from being a completely illegal to a completely essential business. And that's, it doesn't matter how you feel about it. You know, maybe you think that's not right or it isn't right or, you know, your political leanings or whatever it is. That's the truth of the matter of what we're, the day and age that we're living in. So again, just trying to legitimize this as a, a topic at least worth talking about. Now, a little bit of background on marijuana and, and how it works and a lot of times people will, will put cannabis and, and marijuana type products into one big bucket, but really it comes down to two different chemical compounds or two different products, which is THC, which is uh, basically marijuana. It's the compound that elicits the, um, the, the sensation of getting high. So when we talk about marijuana, weed, things like that, that's the THC occupying the CB1 receptor. And when you occupy the receptor, that's when you get all the kind of the effects of being high essentially. And then we talk about CBD, um, which is something that has a, a chemical structure very close to THC and it interacts with the CB1 receptor, but not fully. So you don't get the sensations of being high. So basically THC is for people, you know, smoking and eating to get the sensation of, you know, being high and CBD people use is more like um, oils and shampoos and things like that is as more of a, um, you know, a product not to get them high, but they think there might be some medical benefits of it. So these are completely different. Um, and it's worth keeping that in mind. So just an example, CBD, so this says best CBD products. I, I don't mean that, I just Googled this and it popped up. But you can see this comes in in oils and in hair stuff and skin products and gummies and all these things. And again, they're not to get you high, it's just that people think these might be anti-inflammatory is a common reason people use it. Good for skin tone, good for inflammation, uh, pain in general. Versus, you know, you have THC here in green, which you have all the different ways that people use this, you know, vape pens and tinctures and just in inhalation and, and edibles um, and topicals. And below that is just how bioavailable things are, meaning um, when you smoke it or eat it, how much of the compound you actually get into your system. And you can see it's really variable, especially when you go to the edibles, four to 20%. And that's why sometimes people have issues with edibles is that they affect people differently. And even the same person might have a different absorption on one day than the other. So just kind of keeping that in mind. So you can see it gets kind of complicated pretty quick that these are different uh, products, but there's all different ways of kind of consuming them. And it can be confusing to people, but we can't just lump all this like marijuana stuff into one big bucket because they are, they are different. Now, when it comes to using marijuana, people really have, in my opinion, two main questions, especially with diabetes. I'm talking about people with diabetes. 
and they want to know, is it good or, you know, bad for me? I hear a lot of uh, stuff about, you know, people with diabetes, maybe they should never use marijuana. Or I heard somebody tell me that, you know, it might be good for my blood sugars actually, or, you know, maybe help with my eyes and what's going on with that. And then uh, the second question is, how can I use it safely? And specifically, how, how do I manage my blood sugars if I'm using marijuana? And, and this question is like, you know, it might be independent if it's good or bad for you. You just say, look, you know, I know it's not really related to my diabetes, but I want to use marijuana. Can I, as somebody living with diabetes, use it safely? What do I need to be looking out for? And so this is what I'm going to jump into with um, the next part of the talk. So is it good or bad for you if you're living with diabetes? And what is the truth? And the, the honest truth is we don't really know. We don't have a definitive answer on this. So if anybody comes up to you and says marijuana is fantastic for people with diabetes, everybody should use it, they're full of it. And if somebody says the opposite, marijuana is absolutely horrible for people with diabetes, nobody should use it, they're full of it too. The answer is probably somewhere in the middle and we need more research to kind of tease those things out. Um, so and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you some specific examples about this. But I have this picture of these people which are screaming at each other because people have very like ingrained ideas about this. So I remember giving a talk on this at a TCOID um, conference a couple of years ago. And I was saying, you know, marijuana doesn't really have, you know, that profound effects on blood sugars and people were just adamant, like, yes, it does. And I want to use it. And other people were saying, you know, it was illegal and we shouldn't be using it. So people are very polarized on this. Um, and you can hear kind of people just spouting their very specific views on the topic. But all right. So before we get into the diabetes stuff, it's you have to know the effects of marijuana. And this is all the stuff it does to your body when you smoke it or eat, you know, THC. Um, and it's, you probably can't read all of it, and that's a little bit of the point. But marijuana has really systemic effects. We know, like, a lot of the common ones getting high, you know, red eyes. It can give you a little bit of cough. It can give you the munchies. It can, you know, make you, like, a little muscle weakness, all these different things. But it has effects on basically every organ system. So it's at least worth knowing that and just reminding yourself of the effects that marijuana has, like, before you use it. So you're just at least aware. And even for me, reading through all these, it's like, wow you know, remembering that, yeah, when you smoke or eat a substance, this gets everywhere um, and it can affect essentially everything in your body. Now, what are the potential upsides for marijuana? And I have to admit, when I was making this talk, like I said, this is something that really jumped out. Like, wow, there are some, some a lot of research that's gone on, but it's only really been in for people with type 2 diabetes and sometimes for people without diabetes. The, the evidence in type 1 is really, really sparse. And I'm going to show some of that next. But when it comes to type 2s, um, They've actually shown, why do I have Shaggy here? Because, you know, I'm going to ask you the question. And you think in your mind, like a stoner, somebody who smokes all the time, what do you picture? And you picture a guy that looks like Shaggy. And what is Shaggy? He's super thin, right? Which is weird because the other pictures I found of Shaggy was always with him with like a hoagie or eating something. And there is this paradox with marijuana use that people get the munchies, they eat more calories, but they tend to be thinner. So there's clearly something going on with metabolism that people that use marijuana consistently tend to be thinner. And in people with diabetes, type 2 diabetes, when they ask the question of all these people with type 2 diabetes, the people that use marijuana tend to have a smaller waistline, which is just kind of interesting. So again, not advocating that people use it for weight loss or anything like that. It's just an interesting phenomenon that is associated with marijuana use, and we don't really know the cause. It's also been associated with an increase in insulin sensitivity. That again, if you take healthy people or people with type 2 diabetes, and ask who uses marijuana and who doesn't, the people that use marijuana tend to be more sensitive to insulin. So again, a hint that something's going on with insulin and carbohydrate metabolism. We don't really know this in type 1 diabetes. Lots of evidence obviously helping with pain, uh, aches. This is something that you know, we clearly use it for people with cancer patients that have kind of chronic pain. This is a known phenomenon, a benefit. Actually showed to increase the good cholesterol, the HDL cholesterol, again, in kind of association studies. Um, that it showed that it seems to be good for cholesterol. We don't know what that means for heart risk and things like that. And then definitely has some effects on eyes. You, you know, when you talk about medical uses of marijuana, people always say, oh yeah, glaucoma. And that's, that is a known, you know, use of it. Maybe some evidence helping with retinopathy and things like that, but nothing definitive. So these are all kind of associations, just kind of interesting findings. But I can certainly say that, I cannot say that if you started smoking marijuana or using marijuana, you're going to lose weight and more, be more insulin sensitive. We, we just don't know that. These are just findings that when you pull people with type 2 diabetes, tend to be associated with marijuana use. Now, what about downsides? And this is where the only kind of type 1 evidence we have uh, is. And if you Google type 1 diabetes and marijuana, these are the studies that will come up. 
And these initial studies were looking at people with type 1 diabetes in Colorado. This was, Colorado was the first state to kind of legalize marijuana use, so they, they started asking these questions. And they took all their type 1 patients, or a lot of them, about 400, and, and surveyed them. And about, of the 400 uh, participants, about 30% of them actually used marijuana, so, you know, a fairly high percent. And people with marijuana, they, they matched them to people that didn't use marijuana and found that the people that smoked tended to be y younger, they tended to have a lower educational level, lower income, they tend to have a worse A1C, 8.4 versus 7.6 in this co co cohort. And the scary finding was that they had a, a twice uh, or two times higher risk of, of diabetic ketoacidosis. And this really did hit the, the kind of lay press that marijuana use has, you know, all these things. Like, you know, people use marijuana, have worse blood sugars and, and things like that. But again, we don't know if this is causative or this is just correlation. That it happens to be that people that smoke marijuana tended to have, you know, lower education and, and, and lower income, and that led to these poorer outcomes. Uh, so we cannot say that if you smoke marijuana, you're going to have these things. Again, this is just all we know in terms of associations. But the risk of DKA is obviously concerning. This is a, the number one cause of mortality in type 1s in children, and it's something that, that we want to avoid, obviously. Um, and I have here, again, this like correlation or causation thing that I found this picture that basically you know, people that eat ice cream are more likely to get sunburn, and we know that that's a correlation, and then the reason is because that people are eating ice cream tend to be more in the sun, and so the sun is the thing that's causing the heartburn and, or sorry, the, the skin burn, sunburn, and the ice cream is just associated with that. I did an awful job of explaining that, but the point is that we, we don't know if marijuana is causative of these bad outcomes in type 1s, or it's just kind of correlated, and so that's a problem, but this is something that will come up, and you might, you know, encounter, especially as a type 1, that the, the view is like, you know, this is a dangerous, dangerous substance. So this is, again, where it got a little bit more interesting to me. So I started asking myself, well, why don't we know? If this is such a common medication with this multi-billion dollar industry, I do clinical research, you know, like I would love to study this and, and figure out the effects of insulin sensitivity in kind of a proper randomized control trial. Of like, hey, you, the half over here, you guys are going to start smoking marijuana, and you guys aren't. Well, so looking into this more, the FDA has this system for the schedule of medications where basically starting with schedule one, these are medications that are, you know, dangerous. You basically really don't want to ever use them. They're hard to study all the way down to schedule five where it gets kind of more um, kind of easy to use, user friendly, things like that. And I just wanted to blow up schedule one here, which is kind of the quote unquote worst medications. And it says drugs with no currently accepted medical use and a high potential for abuse they're the most dangerous drugs of all the drug schedules with potentially severe psychological and physical dependence. And you can see examples on the right. Marijuana is a Schedule One medication. And you can agree with that or not. But currently, this is where the FDA has this medication, which makes it very difficult to study. And look at its friends in this category. Heroin, you know, LSD, ecstasy, um, peyote. I don't even know what that methoquinolone is, but I don't, I don't think that's meth. It would be methamphetamine. But anyways, these are some bad characters in here. So saying that it would basically be just as easy for me to study heroin in people with diabetes as it would be to study marijuana. And, you know, personally, I, I don't think they belong in that same category. But when, you know, people ask, like, well, why don't we do more research in it? This is one of the reasons. Clearly, there's marijuana research going on. Clearly, there's CBD research going on, which is a little bit easier. Um, but you do have to go through a lot of additional hoops to make sure that it's, it's, it's safe, etc. So it might be some time before we get an answer on this, uh, which is a little bit unfortunate. So what is my take on is it good or bad for me? Here's me just kind of pondering this, and you can see I was really thinking about it. Um, my take is, um, is this. We don't really know. I think that long-term use has this association with these positive effects, but you know, for type ones, it might be, you know, if you get, if you get high and you forget to do your bolus, you, your pump falls out, um, there's some acute problems that can come up that you need to be kind of, you know, worried about. So my take on it is, you know, if you want to use it, fine, do it in a legal, safe way, but don't try to convince yourself that it's good for you or it's, you know, it's something you should be doing for your diabetes. Um, just make sure you're doing it safely. And that brings me to my next thing. How can I use it safely? All right, Jeremy, I'm, I'm not trying to say I'm going to use it to lower or my cholesterol or whatever. I just, I like to use marijuana. How can I use it safely with diabetes? So how does marijuana affect your blood sugars? And we always compare it kind of to alcohol because but they're different. So alcohol I have on the left has a very direct effect on your blood sugars. It, it, and it's, it's complicated. But alcohol itself will directly affect your blood sugars. And a must-watch thing on our TCOID video vault 
is Steve and I actually drinking alcohol in real time and looking how it affects our blood sugars. And you can see the wheels kind of fall off, and including my, my shirt fell off also. Um, and so I'm drinking beer and Steve's drinking hard, hard alcohol. And you can see the different effects of alcohol on our blood sugar. It's actually it's pretty fascinating. So alcohol has direct effects on your blood sugar. Meaning if I just sit here and was drinking alcohol, my blood sugars would change. Marijuana, we think, has more of an indirect effect, meaning it doesn't directly affect your blood sugars per se. However, it can do two main things that can affect your blood sugar. It can impair your judgment. And I already mentioned, that might mean uh, my pump, you know, if it's uh, the, the catheter is clogged and I'm not addressing it, or, you know, I took my Lantus, my long-acting insulin, and then two minutes later, I'm like, geez, did I take it? And you either, you know, take a second dose or something like that. It can impair your judgment, just like alcohol. And of course, it, it can cause the munchies. And here's our friends, Harold and Kumar. Um, it doesn't actually look like White Castle. It looks more like In-N-Out to me. Um, but, you know, it can increase your, your food intake. And these things put together can obviously make your blood sugars um, go awry. So again, you can see that these things clearly will affect your blood sugars. But it's not that it's just, if I sat here and smoked marijuana, like, you know, all day long, my blood sugars probably wouldn't really change. All right. So how to stay safe, the Jeremy system. So now, I don't want to get anybody's ideas that, you know, this is based on all my like crazy, you know, weed use. I just like to put my name into the system because I thought it'd be fun. And there's some stretches here, uh, as you'll see. So J, this is probably the biggest stretch. Just know how much you're smoking, eating, etc. So I, I mentioned in the beginning that especially with these edibles, you know, they can hit you at different times. Um, so knowing what you're, you're putting in your system is helpful. And this is actually where legalizing marijuana has been really good in the sense that it's very clear when you buy these products now, how many milligrams of THC, et cetera, that you're getting versus before you, you might not have any idea. So if you were just starting to use these for the first time, definitely, you know, starting with very low doses, um, and, and knowing how much you're putting into your system to see how much they'll affect you. E, engage your diabetes tasks before you get high, meaning. If you are going to, you know, get high for the rest of the night, make sure you've changed your pump before you do that or that you've taken your basal insulin or you've bolus for dinner or whatever. Try to just get all that stuff out of the way. So you're, you're limiting the things that you have to do when you have altered consciousness. You know, you don't want to be have to like, again, I'm not advocating people getting super high or things like that. But if it does happen, that's not a time that you want to be uh, dealing with a clogged catheter, changing your pump or taking basal insulin. You want to try to just get that out of the way when you're of right mind. So R, remember to wear your CGM, and that should go for basically any time, whether you're using marijuana or not. But especially when you're, you're on any kind of substance, alcohol, for sure, making sure you're on your continuous glucose monitor because you can be notified if you're low or you're high. Oh my gosh, my blood sugar is 400. It's been there for like an hour. Um, you know, I need to figure out what's going on, take you know, more insulin, whatever it is. But CGMs can be really helpful to just like always monitor what's going on with your blood sugar. It might be difficult to actually test your blood sugar, et cetera. E, second E, is for emesis or vomiting, which means you need to go to the ER if you can't hydrate. And that, that goes for it actually at any time. That if you're sick and you're vomiting and you can't keep anything down, that's when you're at high risk for DKA. So this gets back to my point of, of marijuana being associated with, with high rates of DKA. That, you know, if you're smoking and you start, you know, vomiting and you can't keep something down, that's when you're at high risk for, for diabetic ketoacidosis if you can't hydrate. Because drinking fluids is what really help flush those ketones out. And if you get to a point that it's, you're vomiting and you can't hydrate, that's when you need to go to the emergency room. Again, not to scare people, just good, safe things for people to know. M is for munchies. They still count as carbs, so you have to bolus for them. Just remembering, um, you know, it can be easy to kind of mindlessly eat when you're using marijuana and that you still need to be bolusing or at least wearing your continuous glucose monitor and, and uh, monitoring that and bolusing to correct your blood sugars if they go high. And why is you need to be more responsible than most, so take care of yourself. You know, so that's the fortunate, unfortunate truth. Whether it's alcohol or marijuana or any substance, um, we, we can't really lose control. But we have to be, in some way, you know, always vigilant of what's going on with our, our blood sugars. And at least letting other people around you know um, that you have type 1 diabetes. That you can't just kind of fall asleep in the corner and have people leave you alone. Um, you need to be responsible, and part of that is letting kind of your support network know what's going on, too. Again, this is where CGM can help because it can notify other people in addition to you. So this is the Jeremy system. Um, hope you like it. Take pictures of it, whatever you want. And uh, with that, I just want to say thank you. I hope you enjoyed the talk. Again, I learned, I learned a lot from doing this. And uh, I hope you did too. Thank you.